Out of the book of John, chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Can we say amen? Amen. amen. You may be seated. Any of you guys ever asked something of the Lord and he hasn't done it yet? Sometimes that makes it hard to read that verse, doesn't it? Sometimes we've been struggling through something for a long time and we read verses like that and we're like, well, I, you know, I don't know. There's, we, we see some, some struggles, but God is not a God that he would lie. The things that we are crying out for the Lord to do in his name, he will do it. It may be his way, his time, but he always comes through. You know, there's people that I prayed for their healing and they slipped on to be with Jesus. They got their ultimate healing because they'll never have pain again the rest of their life. It's just all about our perspective. So as we enter into this, this, uh, time, this teaching today, for us to remember that there's going to be some challenges in our mind and there's going to be some challenges that we see that may want to rob us of faith. We have to fight the good fight of Faith. We have to hold on to those words. They are true. And, and he is faithful to finish that which he began. Uh, those of y'all that went down to Mexico, you're going to hear the sermon again. Because it was a word that God gave for me to go down and teach in Mexico. But I believe it's also a word that he wants to speak over our church. As a matter of fact, as I was speaking this word over their church, their pastor came up and said, because of how we are united spiritually, the words that you are speaking over us, I release over your church as well. And that the way the Holy Spirit is manifesting and pouring himself out here, he is going to pour himself out at your church church as well. So y'all get ready to receive what it is that God would like to say. And, but I want to start off by asking you this question. Have you ever done anything in your life that you look back on and you think that was crazy? Anything that you might sit around with some old friends around a table drinking some coffee and talk about some things back in the day and you're like, oh, that was crazy. Matter of fact, Bobby's going to come up right now and share a few of his uh, from whenever. He, I'm just kidding, Bobby. I'm not going to put you through that. <laughs> Do you have a couple crazy stories, Bobby? Just two, right? I think back on some just knucklehead things that I did growing up. Um, I saw my parents this morning, and so I will not be sharing with you all of those things because there are some things that they're just not old enough yet to hear. <laughs> so my dad always would tell me, he's like, son, uh, I did some things whenever I was, in teenage, I was a teenager, I was in college, but you were not old enough yet for me to, to hear, or for, for me to be able to hear those things. And uh, so... Yeah, it's back the same way. Just not quite ready yet, Dad, for, for these things. Um, you think about how in the world did we get where we are in life knowing some of the things that we look back on. There's, there's a couple of stories that, uh, that I shared with them. There was one time that I, I took a mission trip with some good friends, uh, a guy by the name of Jason Daniel, been one of my best friends uh, for a long time. We, we went on the eastern side of Mexico once uh, down. We landed in Cancun and we drove down to the border with Belize to a, a city named Chechemal. And while we were there, we, were, uh, we uh, ate at this one restaurant and it was on the edge of this thing called a cenote. And, and a cenote is basically a big sinkhole. And so this, this big sinkhole formed, water filled it up, and this restaurant is sitting right on the edge of this sinkhole or cenote. 
and we get wind or we hear that there is a platform on the roof of this restaurant and people can get up on the roof and jump off into, the, into this big cenote. And I was like, well, that, that sounds cool. How, how high is this jump off? And they said, oh, it's, it's at least 30 feet, maybe a little bit more. Well, all my table gets up and goes up because they're going to go jump off of this, this platform into the water. And, and I'm skeptical. So I, I walk up to the edge of this platform and I look down and I see these huge tree roots growing out. And in order for me to jump, I'm going to have to get all the way back there, run as fast as I can and jump as far as I can to not get tangled up in the tree roots whenever I fall. So I was like, nope, I'm good. <laughs> And so, you know, I, I look down and no. And so I turn around and I start to walk. And as soon as I turn, two girls come running right by me and jump off. At this point, I'm all in. And I watch them and they land. They, don't, they miss the tree roots. And I'm like, Dad, come it. Now I'm going to have to jump. So sure enough, I back up and I take off running. And I get about one step to the edge and I have that thought, I don't want to do this. But at this point, it's too late. I'm all in. And so I just jump as hard as I can out, and I'm, I'm, I go down. And the two girls that went in front of me, they did not scream as bad as I screamed on the way down. Uh, and I still, Jason and I still talk about that. I'm like, man, that, that was crazy. I can't believe that we did something like that. There was, there was one more story. Um, this one, I don't know if I ever told my mom, so this is going to be, brace yourself. Uh, one time we went on this mission trip down to Mexico, and we went to a village up in the mountains uh, called Suchetlan, which is uh, right on the edge of a volcano, an amazing place. It's authentic Mexican. Uh, where we go in Monsonio, kind of touristy, but this is authentic, what you would think of, of kind of third world country. And this was back whenever I was about 16 years old, and uh, JP was, was the youth pastor, and we went with Chan, the, the missionary, to a little river or creek that ran really close to the, the city of Suchilan, because we were going to have a, a couple, two or three hours of downtime before the service would start that night. And, and so we're all gathered up around the river, and there was a, a guy by the name of Trevor Lewin, that looked at me, and he was an adult leader on the trip, and, he, and, and we were both like, we really want to see this volcano. And, and so we, we had heard that we were on the edge of this volcano, so we think, well, we could probably just climb up a little bit and look down the edge of this thing. I want to see lava, and, and I want to see what an inside of a volcano looks like. So Trevor and I, we snuck off, and we went going through the Mexican jungle to climb up this hill to go look in the edge of the volcano. So we, we're going up hills, we're going down into valleys, crossing uh, little uh, streams, we're walking through sugarcane fields, and I had no idea that sugarcane has stickers all in it. We came out looking like porcupines, we were covered up, uh, and, and it, was, it was a painful experience. But all of a sudden we realize we should be seeing the volcano by now, and we are not. And, and come to find out, Suchilan is actually like still a 45-minute drive from the volcano and here we are trying to walk through the Mexican jungle to get up to it. So we realize we are lost. We have completely, we have no idea where Suchilan is. We have no idea where our group is. I don't know why we thought it was a good idea. And, and we, we began, we thought, how is it that we're going to find our way back into Suchilan? So we climb uh, up on to the edge of this cliff where we might be able to see the city of Suchilan. So we get up there and we look around. We can't see the city completely lost our bearings. No idea. But the one thing we found was we could see that river that ran close to the city. So we climbed down, we found that river, we walked down that river until we could finally got back to where the group was. And I think back now, that was crazy. That was stupid. There is no telling how, I mean, honestly, that's about on the edge of a miracle that we were able to find our way back into that city considering uh, how far we had walked and that we couldn't find it. And we could have gotten that stream and turned the wrong way. Suchilan could have been upstream and we walked downstream. There's, you just, we think back to things in our life and we're like, wow, that was, that was crazy. I asked the staff this question and I found out a lot of interesting things about our staff. Um, 
we have a staff member who uh, mentioned about a skinny dipping experience they had. Um, I'm sure they're the only one in this whole building that's ever had that experience. Um, we had another staff member that was about to get in trouble with their mom. And so they jumped out of a second story window to escape the wrath that was about to come down. Uh, that was crazy. You know, I wonder if when the disciples were sitting around a campfire after a day spent with Jesus, I wonder what kind of crazy stories they told. You see, whenever, whenever, if I was to ask you the question, what's something crazy that you've done? Almost every time we think about something that was pretty much in the flesh, maybe even a little bit sinful or maybe a whole lot sinful, and I think about how whenever the disciples were sitting around with Jesus and they were talking about the crazy things that they had done, it wasn't in the flesh and it wasn't sinful. They were watching the miraculous. They were, they were talking about the crazy things that they just watched. Like, like think about the story about the woman with the issue of blood. Can you imagine the campfire scene after that? All the disciples are sitting around going, how did he know that she was healed? He said he could feel some kind of a power flow out of him. And then, and then this woman who had had years of this issue of blood, now all of a sudden she's healed. Can you, can you imagine that just looking at each other going, guys, that, that was crazy. There's... Another story of where the disciples basically said, that's amazing or that's crazy. The, they were on this boat. They were going across the, the lake or the, the sea and the storm comes up, right? And, and the, the wind and the waves are so severe that they think we are about to die. Water's coming onto the boat. And Jesus, where is he at? He's sleeping in the back of the boat. They go and they wake him up and they say, Jesus, you've got to do something. We're all about to die. Jesus gets up. He rebukes them a little bit first. He's like, you have a little faith. Uh, but then he, he speaks to the wind and the waves. And he says, peace, be still. And the rain stopped, the wind stopped, and the, the sea became still. And it says that the disciples marveled and they exclaimed, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey his command? Just put yourself at the campfire with them that night as they relive that story. And they think about the amazing, crazy things that Jesus had just done. They thought they were going to die. Jesus speaks and now peace has come to their lives. I can imagine just the, guys, what in the world is going on? Who is this guy that we are following and hanging out with? That's crazy. Another story that I bet they, they were freaking out about is uh, whenever there was that demoniac that they used to try to chain up, but he kept busting all the chains and, and it says that that guy used to cut himself and that nobody would go near where he was. They would take the long way around town, kind of like some of us do when we're at, at the grocery store and we see somebody we don't want to talk to. <laughs> That's a whole other sermon. Um, but it, but they, they used to come up to that city or they, up to that place where the demoniac was and they would take the long way around so they wouldn't have to actually encounter this guy. Not Jesus. Jesus is like, no, we're going to go handle this. So he walks right through the middle of where the demoniac's at. And sure enough, this guy, he comes out and he falls down at Jesus' feet. And, the, and the, demonic, the, the demonic begins to speak to this guy and, and says, are you here to torment us before it's time? And, and Jesus tells him, be quiet. But then he says, hey, what is your name? And that's whenever the, the demonic speaks back to him, says, we are legion for we are many. Can you imagine the campfire that night? <laughs> And so Jesus, we know the story, Jesus casts those demons out. They go into a, a, a herd of pigs and, and they go running off a cliff. 
And so, you know, I was just thinking about how if the, the 12 disciples sit around the fire and, and Peter turns to Thomas and he's like, Thomas, you should have seen your face whenever it's a, we are legion for we are many. You look scared to death like a little baby. And, uh, and then Thomas fires back at Peter and says, yeah, but you should have seen your face whenever you were trying to walk on water and you started sinking saying, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Can you imagine? Those evenings as those guys and those ladies that were following Jesus would sit around and talk about what they had just witnessed on a regular occurrence, day after day after day. How crazy, how amazing, how wonderful was that? And we can't leave out the story of Lazarus. They, they, the disciples and Jesus show up and they show up by what we would consider to be late. They showed up late to the party. Lazarus was dead. So Jesus, uh, after some conversation, he walks up and he says, roll away the stone. And they're like, no, Jesus, this guy's been dead for days. He's going to stink. Jesus, I'm not worried about the smell. I'm here to do a miracle. Roll away the stone. And then he says, Lazarus, come forth. Next, so you notice God that's been dead for days comes out of the tomb and everybody around begins to look and say, that's crazy. What if God wants to redefine in our lives what is crazy? What if God wants to do those same things in us today that we read about from centuries ago? What if whenever we sit down at our dinner table tonight, the conversation will be, can you believe what God did today? Can you believe I was in the store today and I saw this person with a crutch and I walked up to them and I asked them if they, if they wanted prayer and I prayed over them and God healed their knee. That was crazy. Uh, you know that, that person in my family that's been battling with cancer, I called them today and, and I prayed over them. They said they could feel the Holy Spirit. They went to their doctor and their doctor said there's no sign of cancer. Hey, or or do, you, do you know the, the person that's been paralyzed and, and they've been bound to a wheelchair and, and I've just been believing God for, for healing and I've been waiting and I've been waiting and, and they finally have come up out of that wheelchair. Those things we read about that they did. But I believe God wants to do that today. I believe that he wants to do it in us. And I'm so crazy enough to believe that God wants to do it through us. You know, a couple of these stories that I'm about to tell of some crazy things that I've been able to be a part of, you might have heard before. There might be some visitors that this will encourage you. Um, some of y'all remember when my daughter was uh, in the womb and waiting to come forth, we had gotten word from the doctor that there was a, a serious issue with her heart. It had formed wrong, and uh, when... The, uh, whenever we went, we could tell they were spending a lot of time in this one area, and we could see on the look, the concern the, on the, on the uh, radiologist's face. And uh, the doctor comes in and says, here's the deal. The, the heart did not form the valve correctly. It's going to require, as soon as she's born, immediate open heart surgery to repair this valve. Uh, and so we were heartbroken, and we, we came to you as a church. And, and we said, would you please stand with us? Would you please pray with us? Because this is scary and we don't want this for our daughter. And uh, so they set up an appointment for three days later for us to go to the specialist that would be doing the surgery on her heart. And, uh, and three days later, whenever he went and he did his pictures, he, he looked at his pictures and he looked at the pictures we had before. And then he looked at his pictures again and looked at the old pictures. And he said, these aren't the same two hearts because this one is healed and whole and has absolutely everything it's supposed to have. And, and so in three days, my God, he rebuilt my daughter's heart. And, and as I speak that, that's my story, but there's been so many of you guys who have watched God do the miraculous in your life as well. And you have your own stories about the crazy things that God has done in and, and through you or for you. Uh, there was another story whenever I was youth pastor 
And we went down to YFN, took a group. I think there's about 50 of us that year. We went down and uh, we're in the middle of, of worship whenever I get tugged on my my sleeve. And one of the, the workers, one of the leaders at YFN had come up and said, hey, uh, are you the youth pastor from Trinity Church? And I was like, well, it depends. And uh and they're like, no, this one's okay. And I was like, okay, then yeah, that's me. Um, and so they, they took me out in the hallway, and one of my girls from the youth group was manifesting the demonic right there in the hallway. And they're like, you need to deal with this. And I'm like, would you deal with it? <laughs> and uh, I didn't really say that. It's a, a young lady that I'd known since she was about three years old and uh, was very much like a daughter to me. And so uh, I walked over and began... And, this girl that we had known each other and had loved like a, a big brother to a little sister for a long time, she looked up at me and with a voice that wasn't her own, she said, I want to kill you. I said, no, no, you're not. You're not, not going to kill me. As a matter of fact, it's time for you to leave. And I got to watch as she went from that angry, twisted, distorted face to just broken and peaceful. And she said, Jesus, I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You see, these aren't things that we just read about from 2,000 years ago. These are things that God is doing and wants to continue to do in our midst today. I can tell you two months ago, one of the most amazing things that I've gotten to, to see and experience took place like this. I, uh, I went to go see somebody in ICU, and uh, they had become septic in their body, uh, just eat up with, uh, with a lot of stuff going on there, but uh, a lot of toxins and, uh, and uh, infection that had just gone out all throughout, and the doctor was saying, we're not sure if she's going to make it. I remember walking into the ICU I remember bending down in her ear, and I could see the screen up on the wall. And, and on the screen, they had all these uh, numbers, and you could see the, uh, the, the heart rate and all the different things that were going on. And every number up there was red, meaning that everything about her was critical. And I, rem I walked in this two months ago. I walked into the, the ICU room, and I bent down, and I whispered in her ear. And I just I called her by name, and I said, hey, I'm here and Jesus wants to heal you. Be healed in Jesus' name. And the nurse that was in the room at that moment popped up from her screen. And she said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Because her, she, we were losing her. And her numbers just turned around and are starting to come back up. And by the time that I left that hospital, her numbers were all either yellow or green. Which means that she was out of the critical. And two weeks later, she was out of that hospital. I speak these things to encourage you, to let you know that let your faith arise and hope in a God that's bigger than us. I can tell you, whenever I walked in that ICU room, I didn't have the faith to move mountains. I was in there to pray, to hope, and maybe encourage a family that was about to lose a family member. I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But God had a different outcome than what was going on. I didn't know, because there's some of you guys that have prayed for a miracle and you haven't seen it happen in, in, in the way that we necessarily thought it was going to be. But I didn't know that God was going to heal my daughter's heart. I, I didn't know what to do whenever I walked into that situation with that girl at YFN. But again, if you would look at the very first verse, John chapter 14. Verse 12. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. If you would flip to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 in verse 7. Here Jesus is about to send his followers out to do the ministry. And he says this. He says, and as you go, 
Preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he tells the disciples this. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Freely you receive, now freely give. Stop in there. So Jesus is talking to who? His disciples, his followers. Who would that be today? You mean it's not just the pastors? You mean God wants to use you to do this? I love to play a game called what if. What if God used you to bring the miraculous? Is that even something on our radar anymore? Because a lot of times we think the miraculous is if we can pay the electric bill this month. What if somebody who has been bound up in addiction their whole life, you prayed with them and the addiction was broken? What if the person who has been battling digestive issues for years, we prayed for them and they were healed? What if the person who is sitting in here right now with back pain, the Holy Spirit would touch you right now and you would experience a healing and a release in the muscles and the joints of your back? What if a man that I love dearly and have so much respect for that is fighting through a lot of pain to just sit here this morning, Isaiah Jernigan, I've been praying for you for years and... and I've had a lot of hard conversations with God because if there's anybody who I think deserves a healing, it's you. If, if we could deserve a healing. What if the guy, same God that formed you in your mother's womb also begins to form a healing in your body and we as a whole church body get to celebrate with you the healing? What if? Is it just the pastor's job? Because I, I get it all the time of people calling and saying, hey, so-and-so wants you to come see them. So-and-so wants you to come pray for them. So-and-so, and then I'm like, okay, I would be glad to do that, but have you prayed for them? Well, no, they wanted the pastor. That's not in here. Jesus said, you do it. Well, just come to church and the pastors will pray for you. I would be glad to. But you're missing out on so much if you think that it's only going to be the pastors. Well, I don't have that kind of faith. Y'all, I could be honest. I don't always have that kind of faith. I'm a human being just like the rest of you. Just trying to get one foot in front of the other most days. I'm having to believe God for miracles just like you are. Let's do this together. Let's, let's get on our knees and let's seek God with all of our hearts and believe him that the miraculous is not something from yesterday. It's not something for tomorrow, but it's for today. You know, I, I think about a prophetic word that was spoken over this church, and I really appreciate Pastor Jim Adkins coming a few weeks ago while I was on vacation and, and teaching the word. Uh, I've gone back and listened to it on podcast. Thank you, Jim, for bringing that word, and then JP the next week, and then Bobby last week. Um, but there was a word that was spoken over this place, that the latter rain would be greater than the former and that's not because of a person, that's because of a Holy Spirit that wants to do even greater things. If you can look back on your life, on something that God has done in your life, and say, that was crazy, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, it has not even entered into your imagination the things which God has in store 
for you. I'm here to speak prophetically over us today. Prepare yourself for the miraculous. Prepare yourself for it not to be something that happens for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, but prepare yourself for signs and wonders to manifest in Walmart and Kroger, to manifest themselves at work, to where maybe even your manager comes up and says, I don't know what's going on over here, but it's kind of disruptive from what's going on in the rest of the store. And then they see that person that's been walking in, broken down, and and in physical affliction is now healed and whole. And they're like, hold on, you just go ahead. What if? You know, it's something that's interesting. David Slate came down and prayed for me. And one of the things when he's praying, he's like, Lord, let us see the miraculous. I said, have you been reading my notes for today? In Manzanillo, this last week, we got down there and our children's director, Katie Epperson, is she in here or is she back in children's church this morning? She's in the back. Katie, the day before we left, had done something and completely messed up her back. And it was so bad to the point that she could not walk one city block without her husband, Brian, having to carry her. And I was like, okay, Lord, there's your first one right there. And sure enough, God healed her back on that trip to where she was able to function fully and normally. She'll even tell you it was a miracle to go from where she was to being able to do it. By the end of the week, she was running around like a teenager. And if you don't, any of y'all that know Katie, you know that that's not an exaggeration. So many salvations as we went out into the city streets and people began to pour out their houses to come to the city square and hear the, the message about Jesus Christ. All the hands that went up and, and BJ was able to speak in Spanish and, uh, and, the, and the, the people who surrendered their lives to the Lord. One of the, one of the real amazing things that took place, uh, it reminded me of a story that Jim's told us a lot of times from being down there, um, is... I was up on stage with the translator and the altar was just full of people. They had all come down and this was the the fourth service. I was tired. I didn't feel like I was bringing my A game in, but the altar was full of people. And I look over on my left and there is a woman and I could sense something was going to happen with that lady. And so we had one of our college age that was praying for her. And so I looked over at one of our uh, ladies and I said, would you go over and uh, help her in, in praying? So I watched her grow over. Next thing I know, the two of them are standing with this lady and she begins to contort and to just go into, and she falls out on the floor and begins to almost slither like a snake on the floor. And I turned to my interpreter and I was like, we need to get uh, in the middle of this. And so we jumped down there and began to pray over this lady as she was completely set free from the demonic. Happened a week ago today. One week ago today. I watched it with my own eyes. And the peace that was on that woman's face as she laid there in the presence of God. And... uh, There's no telling the amount of torment that she had been under for years. And now she knew peace. What if today God wanted to do something crazy in our midst? What if tonight, as you sit around your dinner table with your family or with your loved ones, and you begin to talk about the things that happened during the day, it wouldn't just be about, well, I did this at work, and then I ran this errand, and then I picked up the kid, and I dropped him at this. But that's typically what we talk about from our day. What if you sat down at the table and you said, something happened today. It was crazy. I was somewhere just buying some milk and some eggs, And I looked over and I saw somebody and I just felt that pull in my heart that I was supposed to go pray for him. And I went up and as I began to pray for him, the Holy Spirit fell right there in the middle of the store and and they gave their life to the Lord or they told me that they were uh, that they were sick and and, and the Lord healed them. What, What if is there any of us that have that desire or are we just content to go through life and have just lived a good life? Because God said Greater things than these. 
last verse is in Matthew chapter 10. Where I read that, where it says that he has sent us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. What if? Worship team, would you come up, please? You know, there was a there was a time that we watched manifestations of the Holy Spirit even more than what we do today. Would you pray and believe with me that the Lord is going to open up a new time, a new season, and a new wave for us to experience the miraculous in this place? That it would spill out of this sanctuary into our everyday lives. And the purpose isn't so that we can go around and tell these really cool stories The purpose is that the kingdom would grow and that people would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, Think about the woman at the well. The woman at the well was just having a conversation with Jesus until he stepped out into something that didn't make sense to her. Whenever he said, you know, you're right. You've had five husbands and the one that you're with now is not your husband. Then she was like, oh, I can tell that you are a prophet, a man of God. Then whenever all the people from town come out to meet him, they said, at first we believe because of the stories that she had told us. But now we have come to know you for ourselves and we have seen with our own eyes how amazing that you are. You see, as God does the miraculous through us, it's going to draw people to him. They're going to want to see that. They're going to be a part of that. But it's never to draw the attention to us. It's that we might grow the kingdom and that that they would see how good God is. You know, today I just felt like I needed to take a break from the series I've been on about dying to ourselves and encourage us as a church body. If you've been praying for something and you haven't seen it, continue to pray. If, if you have been believing God to, to uh, heal a, a sickness, a, a disease, then, then continue to just continue to pray and believe God for the miraculous. But the last thing that I do want to say is that there was even a time whenever Jesus could not operate in the miraculous. Even Jesus had a time, hard time operating in the miraculous. And it was because he was back in some hometown areas that they just knew a carpenter's boy. And so they didn't want what Jesus had. And, and sometimes the thing that is keeping us from our miracle is that somebody in the process is not joining the process. And it's not because we've got to have this huge faith, it's, but it's, it's that part of the process is that we've got to come to a place of surrender that comes to Jesus and says, we want what you want. I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to surrender. Surrender.